Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. And uh, welcome to the fiscal openness session of the 2021 OGP Academy, the case for open government. This session provides simultaneous interpretation to English, Korean, Spanish, and French. So please go to the interpretation tab uh, of your Zoom account and click on the language you prefer. So my name is Manal Fouad and I am Assistant Director at the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. And on behalf of the Open Government uh, Partnership, the Korean Development Institute School of Public Policy, the International Budget Partnership, and the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency, GIF, I am delighted to moderate this panel and I thank you all for taking the time to join. In the lead up to the 2021 OGP Global Summit, the OGP Academy aims to engage academics and experts in various sessions to share new research developments in different areas of open government to capture open government impacts inside and outside of OGP and to devise new future research collaborations. The Fiscal Openness session today will present a comprehensive review of recent evidence on the impacts of fiscal openness on budget outcomes. Based on published research, academic research and policy oriented research covering the period from 2015 till now. The review authored by Joachim Wehner and Martin Haus constitutes an update to the work produced in 2015 by Joachim and Paolo De Renzio. The Impacts of Fiscal Openness, a Review of Evidence. In that study, our authors identify the impacts of fiscal transparency and public participation in budget management, budget implementation, policy outcomes, and development indicators, as well as other accountability topics that are relevant for IBP, GIFT, and OGP's agenda. If I also put my IMF hat for a moment, this is also a crucial topic for us. Fiscal openness and transparency have stood high on our policy agenda. Bringing out evidence of these relationships is very important in strengthening the case for fiscal openness. So I look forward to this session. The session will also feature ideas for future research on the impacts of fiscal openness. So let me quickly introduce uh, the panel, and I'm very delighted to be joined today by Joachim Wenner, Associate Professor at London School of Economics and Political Science. Stuti Hemani, Senior Economist at the Development Research Group of the World Bank. Ritva Reinika, Professor of Practice, Alto University School of Business, Helsinki Graduate School of Economics. And Silvia Vanutelli, Assistant Professor, Northwestern University Department of Economics. Welcome to all of you. Uh, our panelists have been studying and working on today's topics in a wide range of research projects and policy interventions, and you can read their full bios on the WOVA platform. One of OGP's um, mission, key missions, is to stay up to date on the evidence of what works and how, and how specific open government policies uh, can be. For this reason, OGP is collaborating with partner organization to conduct state of evidence reviews that can inform open government reforms across geographies and themes. So to begin today's uh, session, uh, Joachim Werner, co-author of the state of evidence review on fiscal openness will present the preliminary findings of the paper. Uh, this paper will be published jointly by OGP, IBP, and the, and the GIFT in early 2022. After his presentation, panelists will share their perspectives on the topic from their area of expertise. We welcome uh, participants' um, uh, um, interventions in the Q&A section after the panel discussion, as today's discussion will continue to inform this research as it is being finalized. To ask your questions to our panelists, please use the Q&A tab available on Zoom. So uh, without further ado, uh, Joachim, over to you and you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here with such a great group of scholars and, and practitioners. Um, let me give you a quick uh, background here on, on the study. So fiscal openness, as you know, is an important and fast moving field. And there has been a lot of new research output. Um, I was part of a review uh, in five, six years ago that looked at some of the evidence on the impacts of fiscal openness. I'll define it in a second. And we found a few studies that documented impacts on corruption, accountability, and also resource allocation. For our update, we surveyed 55 scholars and practitioners, got more than 30 uh, responses, well in excess actually of 30, some very generous and, and detailed, including more than 200 uh, citations and, and references. We reviewed these and essentially asked the following questions. We wanted to look at studies that examine fiscal openness as the independent variable of interest, which could be either the provision of budget information or of a participation opportunity at any stage of the budgetary process. So the government provision of budget information or um, a participation opportunity. Any sort of outcome related to budgets themselves, governance, human or economic development. We were very open. We, have, we were particularly interested in studies that had a strong research design that allowed causal, causal inference. In some areas, that's not possible. So we were looking also for robust uh, correlations. Um, and we limited the time period to uh, research published since the past review. Let me give you a few highlights and in the remainder, then I want to focus on some of the core takeaways that we are, we've drawn from, from what we found. So this is very high level, very, uh, very basic in some ways. So we found around 30 studies covering participation and, and transparency um, or something in between, uh, some that only a couple that looked at both within the, in the same research design. Uh, we noticed that public policy scholars or political scientists had more to say uh, about participation, whereas economists tended to say more about transparency and in particular audits. Um, we were pleased to see that some earlier gaps we had identified in 2015 were starting to get a look. For example, we have work on procurement, something that was a gap, uh, revenue as a dependent variable, uh, studies unpacking the mechanism that mechanisms that connect some intervention in this area with an impact. Uh, there were some interesting examples where people were tracing the process very carefully. And we also noted that participatory budgeting is not only something that is studied in Brazil, which was more the case in, in under the previous uh, uh, review, but something that is increasingly getting attention also empirically in other parts of, of the world. If we are very narrow in terms of thinking about impacts and we really think about studies that can make a credible claim to identify causal effects, we come to a very small basket of studies, uh, eight studies that either deploy experiments or, or, or field experiments where there is randomness in the assignment of some treatment or quasi experiments uh, that maybe fall a little bit short of randomness but get, get very close uh, to it. So a very small set of studies and these looked at audits. Um, they, amongst this basket, there's there are a couple of nice nice papers that are highlighted here. And Sylvia is here. She's one, one of uh, the contributors to, to this set of studies. Uh, so there are important new angles uh, in this work, for example, focusing on audit quality, pointing out that we need to pay attention to the quality of audits which is related to the independence of auditors, for example. And then also a nice paper looking at Chile, uh, highlighting some of the potential side effects of, of audit regimes in, in procurement. So these studies have also moved a little bit beyond the traditional outcome sets to highlight these somewhat more nuanced and new angles in thinking about uh, the impacts of audits in particular. Um, rather than going through a whole bunch of abstracts here. I want to uh, put forward four implications that we draw from, from our review. 
um, and four kind of lessons that we think should be taken into account in taking this work forward. The first one is scholars need to work more with governments directly. So in contrast to the explosion of work on transparency and, uh, and accountability more broadly, including some work um, with budget information, um, there's very little work on uh, causally identified work uh, that looks at fiscal openness per se. So a lot of work in transparency and, and, and accountability looks at interventions that are delivered by NGOs, or researchers, for example, through scorecards, flyers, SMS messages, and the like. And it's just very unclear what that can tell us about the government opening up the budget or opening up the budget process. So these, the, that literature is not, not um, it's very unclear to what extent that literature is useful. And there's much more limited work in, in this area on government openness. So one thing we urge in conclusion is that we need more experimental work in collaboration with government, evaluating government action directly and feeding also into government decision-making. Second point, um, we need to move from studying programs to also thinking about how that adds up to uh, budget systems or public financial management systems. So budget systems are very complex. They bring together many actors and processes, and they're also embedded in a broader context that affect their performance. Field experiments often have a program logic that focuses on identifying partial equilibrium effects. Natural experiments get somewhat closer to understanding the, an accountability ecosystem, including, for example, the role of the media which is one of the features that uh, was explored in earlier work on audits. But there's a lot more that we could do to add other actors of the PFM system, the public finance system, to these sorts of discussions. So for example, the legislature, the role of the legislature. So we need to build more understanding of multiple interlinked changes across different actors and not, not necessarily with a predefined endpoint. So we also need to study pro uh, processes over a longer time period including feedback loops and so on. I was reminded in one of the last sessions where I presented this uh, of a comment by uh, Claudio um, uh, Ferraz, who was saying, who was observing that there has been a, a transparency backlash, for example. These are the sorts of things, how actors respond to transparency initiatives and kind of their feedback loops in, in this broader system that ultimately affect what, what we're observing. So, moving the study of programs or individual interventions forward to gaining more a broader understanding of how systems work and perform. Third, and very importantly, in 2015, uh, when Paolo Dorenzio and I did this review, we, we noted that only a single study looked at the relationship between, or looked at participation and transparency within the same research design. That was the famous study by Olken, where you essentially, uh, he, he pitted um, bottom-up bottom -up community monitoring against top-down audits. And one of the key takeaways was that top-down audits are more, more effective, seem more effective than bottom-up monitoring. And there just isn't enough of an evidence base on the relationship between these two. There's a single study uh, that's still a working paper, as far as I know, not yet published, that reassesses the Olken data set and actually adds a different specification to the data, kind of interaction effect between transparency and, and uh, participation, if you want. And the findings suggest that the two may be substitutes rather than complements. So monitoring can be as effective as top-down audits, but only in contexts where top-down audits are not implemented simultaneously. So there's something about the relationship between different types of openness measures that we still have to untangle and study in a wide variety of contexts. There's way too little on this. So are these complements or substitutes? If the latter, which is more effective, under what conditions? There's a whole range of questions left unexplored here. And my final point is that we need to also be aware of trade-offs, especially in low capability contexts. So this relates a little bit to the prior point, but it's a bit broader. So there are opportunity costs. 
uh, to any sort of intervention, any sort of reform that we undertake in, in government. And we know that from the PFM world, uh, for example, there has been a lot of criticism of some PFM reforms pursued by certain uh, actors or often promoted, for example, the implementation of medium term expenditure frameworks or very advanced performance budgeting uh, reforms that might actually not be suitable for a given context and divert scarred resources and skills from better users. And I think when making the case for, for transparent government and open government, we need to remain very sensitive to this possibility and just incorporate that into our, our thinking. We need to have a good answer to that. So I urge also scholarship that, uh, that is aware of this and thinks about this potential trade-off. What is it that might not be happening as a result of undertaking a transparency or participation initiative? That's really it. Let me leave it there. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joachim. A very insightful presentation and a lot of, of uh, new insights um, about the, the topic, including your, uh, your findings on fragmentation and also uh, how different actors respond and uh, the, the capacity uh, that need to be taken into account. That's, uh, that's very interesting. So. Uh, let me now turn to the first discussion, uh, discussant, uh, Stuti from the World Bank, if you would like to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Manal, and thank you everyone for uh, inviting me and to uh, Joaquim for his uh, insightful presentation. Um, can you hear me? I... Yes. Okay, great. Let me just share. I do have a couple of slides to just help um, um, ground my uh, points. Okay. Um, so may I take the opportunity to step back a bit and remind ourselves what is the overall objective of fiscal openness? So um, I would suggest that the objective is really uh, this overarching uh, idea of good government. And we live in times where there is a re-emergent role for good government to address problems broadly classified as problems of the public good. And we've moved beyond the old debate of markets versus state in the process of uh, encouraging economic activity. Even as markets have won the day as, as institutions that encourage economic activity, uh, problems like a global pandemic, public health concerns related to that, uh, continuing conflicts and refugee problems, climate change, of course, these are all problems that are textbook cases for the role of government. And yet it, the economics about the behavior of government is far less developed than the economics of how market transactions occur. So I would very uh, succinctly summarize two distinct aspects of good government. Uh, political agents, the political leaders who have the who wield the ultimate power over public policies, uh, good government would consist of political agents who try their best to pursue good public policies based on the best available evidence and learning from both success and failure. And the second feature of good government is to have professional bureaucracies who are capable of and accountable for implementing these public policies. And what where fiscal openness comes in is as a means to that overarching objective. And what this review is asking is what's even more specifically, what is the impact of government openness in the budget process? It's, uh, different aspects of openness. Uh, so one, aspect of openness is what I would call direct democracy. It's actual participation of citizens in determining budget allocations. 
And the second is the more, uh, uh, is the aspect of representative democracy, which is using the information that's available from open budgets and fiscal transparency to try to influence the behavior of uh, various government agents. So here I would posit that uh, in the review piece, it would be very helpful for every study that is examined to answer the following question. Who uses the information available from fiscal openness to undertake what types of actions and to influence whose behavior in positions of public office? So here, the first point that Joaquin made about uh, we need to only focus on what governments do uh, is I think uh, is something I would push back a little bit against because uh, the idea of fiscal openness is sort of like what software developers call an open app. Uh, precisely the goal of having open government is so that society can then use that information, package it in different ways, and therefore there is a role for NGOs and civil society and um, uh, actors within and outside uh, government in how they use that information. And uh, in the few minutes I have, I'd just like to put on the table uh, recognizing certain limitations of fiscal openness. So the first limitation uh, is that the problems of our age is suggesting, such as COVID-19 and climate change, is suggesting that we need technocrats to rely upon to determine public policy. And there is in fact a role for trust in these professional bureaucracies who are trained and equipped to ask and address certain problems rather than direct citizen participation. And second, that's another set of problems that we've seen do not seem to be amenable to addressing through budget information alone. So these are the types of problems that I would broadly call identity politics or uh, uh, ideological politics where political leaders who get selected do not have appropriate incentives to pursue what we are calling in abstract good public policies. Uh, instead, the incentives are to deliberately divide people on various, along various uh, identity cleavages. And it's unclear that budget information can help uh, address this kind of failure of good government. And so I would end by positing that the research agenda on government is urgently needed because of the problems of uh, public goods of our times. And in order to undertake this research agenda, I think there is a need to move beyond just one type of means, which is fiscal openness, and focusing on the objectives. Uh, and in focusing on the objectives, even in research, on fiscal openness, I think the mechanism design approach in economics, uh, I'm thinking of the work of Nobel laureates like uh, Roger Myerson, uh, who use game theory, which is very appropriate to understanding um, political institutions uh, and with, uh, as, as games of multiple equilibria. And then how do you, how do policymakers at various uh, uh, levels design agency relationships, keeping the objectives of good government in mind. And uh, in the World Bank's research division, we have, uh, we did a report on government um, uh, back in 2016, and we are building on that work now, uh, looking at the principal agent relationships between government, between citizens and political leaders, how political leaders design contracts and delegate to public officials, what kinds of tasks should be delegated to appointed bureaucrats versus elected local officials, and what kinds of contracts for frontline uh, providers. In each of these principal agent relationships, there is always a role for information. So the fiscal openness agenda is very intricately linked uh, to this overarching agenda on government. Uh, but my uh, suggestion would be to move to be much more micro empirical uh, and focus much more on these issues of uh, trust 
in public, uh, in professional bureaucracies and the role of uh, uh, political contestation uh, in shaping it, preferences in society uh, to address uh, common interest public goods. So let me stop there. And I thank you all again for inviting me. Thank you very, very much, uh, Stuti, all very uh, relevant uh, and good points. And uh, maybe we'll have time to come back to them later. Thank you. Uh, may I now call on Ritva uh, for uh, her remarks? And uh, if you could please uh, stick to five minutes, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Manal and uh, everyone for inviting me for this session. And uh, also, it's uh, it's nice to come after Stuti because Stuti gave such a big picture, and I love big picture generally. But um, but my comments go much more to the perhaps based on what I was reading. And I just wanted to mention that. Um, the background you see there is my Alto University in Helsinki, where I work as a professor of practice. But I'm very much a practitioner, even, even that professorship calls that. So I'm very much a policy-oriented person, and these comments come, come from there. So I have really, say, nine points. And um, first, I wanted to say that it's really good to do meta-analysis and research summaries. So in, in that sense, I haven't looked at these issues for many years in the way you look at them now. So in a way, my comments are very much um, sort of what I read. And of course, in development economics, which is my area, and particularly I work a lot in education, um, it just so has happened uh, ever since I left the World Bank, it's really common in development economics because there are hundreds of ex experiments being done in education, for instance, these days. And then you, you would, your head spins if you don't have these reviews. So reviews, they bring stuff to findings to wider audiences, including practitioners. So in my work, in teaching especially, I have found that research on the role of audits uh, in reducing uh, corruption, very interesting. And I only, you know, when I've been teaching, discovered Ferras and Finan papers and uh, the, the series on Brazil that look at electoral accountability. And I think it's really great work. So, so I, you highlight that, and that's something um, that that is really good and good to bring and of course i can see from your papers that it is very much appreciated i appreciate it as well and maybe now i get to know some other papers and can add to my reading list in the new summary you mentioned so the i guess my role in this is that long time ago we did evaluate a newspaper campaign in Uganda, and you mentioned that in the review, and that was research I was doing with, with a colleague. Um, we used public expenditure surveys because we didn't know what actually the spending was and what was happening in practice. And then the government of Uganda a long time ago launched an information campaign, and we then evaluated it, looked at how it reduced corruption and what impact it had on service delivery. So you mentioned in that new review that you don't really see any other research in, in that area. And uh, what I wanted to add to that, that practitioners world over still use that. I get every year request, even if I haven't been in this for so many years, uh, requests of doing these types of surveys. So it, it's practitioners that do that. Newspaper campaigns happen in post-conflict situation where you have extremely weak uh, capacity, state capacity. So in a way, it leads me to ask is that how much is this research agenda influenced what actually happens in countries? Or is it influenced by the fact that nowadays you can't publish if you can't demonstrate causality. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an issue. So, 
And I think I fully agree with you, Joachim. You highlighted perhaps more in your presentation than I understood from the draft paper, is that in I am totally with you saying that one has to work with governments on real things rather than carry out experiments that are invented by researchers often in rich countries or NGO activities. They really don't take you very far. And now that I work quite a bit in Finland, uh, randomized control trials have uh, also become more popular. They're not as in development economics, but they, they really begin to happen and are happening. And there is no one who dreams on running an experiment without actually having a real program. So there's, it, it's just not even, even ever thought of that you would do a researcher's own intervention. And it's not easy, even in the enlightened context. If you think Finland may not be an enlightened context, but if you assume it is, uh, it's not easy to set up these uh, joint activities where you where you really do that. But once you get them, they, are, they can be very powerful. So so there I really agree with, the, with you. The other thing you wrote in the paper that um, you encourage, um, um, you, you would like to see researchers looking at budget-related participation and transparency on human development. But I, I kind of felt when I read that, that that's a lost cause. Why? Because there are so many proximate causes of proximate causes of proximate causes. And if you think of mortality or some education is easier, but if you think of those, there are so many hundreds of issues that there is no way you need million observations to get the statistical power to see budget openness to have an impact on uh, on uh, on final human development outcomes. So, okay, then my seventh point out of nine is that um, when I was reading your paper, I thought, oh, how did we think about public expenditure? We used to think, and maybe that's like so passe, but that's we we first thought who gets the budget is a question, benefit incident studies. Okay, they were not very good because the in incidence was estimated by the budgeted expenditure and in poor countries where state capacity is weak, that's just not the case. But anyway, then, uh, then you can say, you can then say uh, perhaps does that, okay, let me go first to say how the four issues we think and then just comment on from your paper's perspective. So who gets the budget benefit incidents? Does the money reach the intended beneficiary? Can you do expenditure tracking or look at admin data or determine how good is that? But then you come to service delivery, do services work? I have been more than 10 years involved in service delivery indicators where you look at the teachers, health workers behavior. What do they do? What do they know? Do they know to diagnose? Empirically, that's empirical work. I think my preference has been focusing on the behaviors like that. And finally, fourth, demand. Do households, uh, do households demand or use the services? So, so in a way, in this context, if you just look at budget transparency and participation, it comes across like a limited agenda. Maybe you could ask if I use this framework, does your work of transparency and participation affect the incidents, the benefit incidents? Does the money reach better when you do this? Do people pay attention? Do, people, do service providers pay attention and do a better job when you have this kind of thing? Or does it impact households perhaps in their demand for services? I, I don't know whether there's any, any, whether this would be a helpful, but I was just trying to think, I was looking for a framework. Stuti provided a very nice framework. That, that's one way. Uh, the, so mine is like lower level kind of framework, but that's, that's what I was thinking. Obviously then the World Development Report 2004, making services work for poor people, which has this 
so it doesn't talk about the principal agent, but that's what it is, relationships of accountability. And in a way, so it's politics, it's the compact management and client power. And then you have finance, delegation finance, information motivation, that we always said was in each of these relationships of accountability. And in a way you talk about finance, you like bring the client power into finance. We often in the world development report kind of thought of bringing it into service delivery front line. Final point, uh, you highlighted systems and particularly in economics, it's very hard these days to do systems work because the, the identification and Stuti called for detailed micro work, that's what you need to identify well, otherwise you will never end up in a review because you can't publish your paper. Uh, but I wanted to mention the program I've been involved in last uh, several years in a very small role. It's a huge program called RISE, Research on Improving Systems of Education. And it is a really, uh, it's uh, led by Lan Pritchett and it's, uh, it's, it's like a huge program, $50 million program. So it creates only research, no, nothing else. It does make an effort to do that to look at symptoms of the problem that kids are not learning, look in diagnostics, how you diagnose that, and what therapeutics you have. So there might be some strengthening of your systems approach was possibly found. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ritva. Also very uh, insightful comments that complement uh, Stuti's so let me now turn to our uh, final discussion, uh, Sylvia. And uh, let me also just remind uh, the audience that you can post questions in the, in the chat. So uh, Sylvia, over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. I just like shared my slides, hope you can see it. So first of all, thanks, really thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, and thanks you Artem for including my paper in this review. It was kind of emotional. I finally, you know, after a PhD, you feel like maybe you're doing something that is useful uh, also outside of academia, hopefully so. And this type of events is like uh, the ideal setting to actually feel useful. So uh, I love the review. It was uh, so inspiring for my future research. Uh, unfortunately, I think especially in economics, reviews are not enough. Uh, rewarded from a publication point of view. And so we have too few, but they are crucial to really help us understanding uh, the direction in which we need to go. So uh, I will probably repeat some of the insights that have already been highlighted by previous discussions, but let me first highlight why I think we need fiscal openness. And so I consider fiscal openness to be a crucial tool to ensure accountability of government at any level. So we're trying to solve a principal agent relationship that can be happening at different levels of government. And, in, and, and more specifically, I think uh, that fiscal open really helps us to solve what I call the rules versus discretion trade-off in regulating bureaucratic behavior. And by this, I mean that you know, we might uh, think that it's a good idea to write very specific rules that really constrain budgetary allocations, uh, but then we know that this comes at the cost of not being able to face, um, to make flexible decisions, in, and this might be particularly important uh, when you need to respond to the needs of citizens, so we might actually want to leave some discretion, but then when we leave discretion, this might come at the cost. Uh, of having corruption or misuse of public funds. And so having trans transparency is a tool to ensure accountability and to improve uh, the solution of, this, uh, of these trade-offs. And I think accountability becomes particularly important uh, um, in, in moments, for example, like the ones we are living now, uh, uh, post the, the COVID crisis, where we are injecting a lot of money into local governments um, and, um, and we might not have, uh, we have the need of spending this money fast, so we are relaxing rules. 
and we might not be able to, to control exactly how this money is spent. Or in low capability contexts, as Joachim highlighted at the end of the discussion, where we might not be able, we might not have institutions that are strong enough to deter corrupt behavior. And so we need to have some other form of, of, of control over the, over the bureaucracy. And so in the end, what really matters, uh, and I think what the review was really trying to achieve is really understanding what are the determinants of effectiveness of fiscal openness and, and also when it is more uh, useful. And so in my, my core area of expertise, uh, as you have highlighted, is monitoring and audits uh, uh, because I think this is actually quite important in the sense that I think that auditors play a dual role. Uh, in the sense that they first, they're, they're users of the information provided by fiscal openness because they look at budgets that they would not be otherwise able to look at uh, if they were not open. But on the other hand, they're also providers of additional information in the sense that they aggregate the information that is provided by fiscal openness that by itself might not be useful enough and they aggregate this information usually for two different type of agents on the one hand they aggregate information for specialized agents think about supreme audit institutions that might have a capacity constraint they cannot look in detail at all the single budgets but they also aggregate for a for a way less skilled type but but crucially important type of of stakeholder which are citizens which by themselves might not be able to read a budget um, and, and so they need the, the, the help of auditors. And so in this sense, I really think that auditors are key players, not just to justify the why I'm obsessed with them. Uh, and, so I, and so in this study, my particular focus of expertise is, is, is actually raising the attention on the fact that the design of monitoring institution really matters for the quality of auditing. So what I show in my paper is that if we do not ensure independence of auditors, the quality of audit of, of, of audit and in the end, the, the, the fiscal sustainability of governments is compromised. And on the other hand, there are ways that are very simple in which governments can change the design of monitoring institutions to ensure auditors independence. Okay. And so going back to the future areas of research, I really think that the four steps that, uh, that you all highlighted are, are great and I'm trying to work and contribute to at least some of these of this research. So the first thing I want to say is that I really agree that we need to work more with governments. In this sense, I think we really need to understand better what is the objective of government monitoring. So in particular, for example, I think in many contexts, there is a problem of intergovernmental relationship. And so there is it's monitoring of one level of government vis-a-vis -vis another level. And so we really need to understand what are the trade-offs involved in this policy design and the fact that legislators themselves, when they're designing an institution, they need to take into account the fact that other agents within government might be reactive to that. And so I think that we need, if we really want to want to work with governments to build better policies, it's really important to, to work more in understanding exactly what are the stakeholders. So this goes back to the second point, which is from programs to system, where I really think we need to have, as, as it was highlighted earlier, a, more of a mechanism design perspective, which was a little bit the spirit of my uh, paper, where essentially I'm really thinking about the role of institutional designs uh, and how much different types of institutions can affect the quality of auditing and in the end, the effectiveness of fiscal openness. Um, and then I think the third point is a very interesting one, but it's also a very difficult one, because as I said, engaging citizens it's not obvious because the engagement of citizens crucially depends on the quality and the availability of information and how this information is processed. And then finally, I think that understanding the trade-offs, which is something I'm, I'm working on right now, for example, I'm working on the role of auditing in the United States and how much, uh, whether audits of federal funds are useful or not. In the sense that I think that we need much more work thinking about how the value of auditing and of fiscal openness varies by context. There could be contexts in which we already have very strong institutions and in which maybe audits are just an added burden, a bureaucratic burden, and they're not really adding much because we already have institutions that are strong enough to, the, to deter corruption in the first place. Or think about the opposite case in which you can have audits, but if you are in a country where you cannot enforce 
the consequences of an audit, then probably audits are useless anyways, even though there is a lot of corruption to discover and, and, and you might think that this disclosing information is important. So I think that these four future areas of research are all like crucial. Hopefully, uh, I, I will, we all uh, can work together to move uh, our understanding forward. I'll stop because I think I'm already over time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sylvia, and uh, thank you for laying out very clearly further areas of research. I think this is uh, very uh, interesting and useful. Um, so we we just have a few minutes for Q and A. Um, I see there is one question um, in the Q and A. Um, what does the open governance look at to keep as a stick in knowing how nations uses the resources that allow the citizen be aware. Um, I don't know if someone would like to take this question, Joachim, maybe. Um, I think. I'm not. I'm not sure. I fully understood. So um, maybe um, could could Winston clarify the question in the meantime? Uh, we, we just have a few minutes left. Um, I don't know, Joachim, if you want to react to the um, to to the the points made uh, briefly. Just just very briefly. This was immensely useful. I have to say, I, Stuti, I particularly liked the question that you posed. Uh, you know, in terms of who uses information, you can also ask who participates, right? Um, for what actions um, to influence whose behavior? I think that is a really that's really good. I will think about I will think about that. Um, and uh, Ritva, that it was fantastic to have you here on the panel. And as you saw, your I mean your work is has defined has been really important in this area. And I was surprised to find uh, and you say, you say now that a lot of pets are still happening. Public expenditure tracking surveys through them and with them at least as far as i can tell unless i've missed something really major and that's that's very interesting i i did like um the 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 kind of chain that you set out from budgets to you know implementation of budgets service delivery and demand and what is the role for openness you post post the question and i can it made me think how transparency and participation can do different things across these dimensions so for example uh, participation is very good in making sure that you choose to provide the right services, that you actually know what people want, etc. So in terms of getting priorities right. Um, but transparency might matter more, more for some of these other links in, in the chain. I'm going to have a good think about that. The one question I would say, um, the one thing I would say is in terms of the link between budget execution and service delivery, I would, I, would, I would think good budget execution, which is the core challenge, I think, in most poor countries. If, if I have to point to one challenge in budgeting, I would probably pick this one in poor countries. It's at least a necessary condition for good service delivery or for service delivery. Probably not a sufficient one, but for like, it's a, it's a, it's a necessary condition. So I think it's really, I would say if you pay the teachers, if you pay the nurses, if you pay the, if you get the supplies into the clinic or something like that, uh, you've done a, a lot of, of the service delivery. I think it's, it's, it's a necessary condition at least for, for service delivery. But I love that chain and I'm gonna have to think where does transparency and, and participation fit in. And um, yeah, just very briefly, Sylvia, I love the last point that, that you made about giving the example of the US and then also the point about how we might we might promote openness in a context where because it doesn't have any consequences, it may not actually deliver, or maybe it even have, has adverse effects. There was a paper a few years ago looking at um, giving voters audit information and it seemed to kind of deter deter their participation in the electoral process because it sort of de it, it, it demotivated them. They just thought, you know, um, it, it kind of debilitated them. 
Uh, so I think that that was a very interesting kind of that was very useful for me to think about that last point. And I look forward to your paper on the United States. And this is very selective, but these were really great points. The first two more systematic and the other, I, I like those additions for, for the final point in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joachim, and, and uh, the discussions. Uh, I think this, this was uh, uh, super interesting and I'm sure it will be very useful for the next step in the paper. Um, unfortunately, I think we have to, to move on. Uh, there, there uh, are, there's another question on the chat on uh, social par participation, uh, but I think this will take a long time to uh, respond to. So maybe we can, we can um, uh, uh, the organizers can, can respond bilaterally uh, later uh, on. Manal. Yes. Manal. Yeah, just very briefly, I think it be, be, that's before when we discussed this that, okay, you can have an audit and there is no consequences, I think, and, and then uh, in a way the future work that Sylvia will do perhaps goes some way to answer the first question, like, is there a stick, you know, if, if things don't happen, so I think, that, so um, the person who asked that Swinston maybe got an idea that actually that is being looked at. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ridva. Yes, that's a very good point. Okay, so um, so I think we have to, to move on um, before we, we adjourn. So we are going to hear from Dr. Sujin Park, Professor of the Energy Policy and Engineering Department of the KEPCO International Nuclear graduate school who will uh, speak about public investment management. This is actually a very important topic uh, system in Korea. Um, because uh, Dr. Uh, Park is based in Korea, um, the, his intervention is, uh, is uh, videotaped uh, because of the time difference. And then uh, we'll uh, get together again for the concluding um, remarks at the end. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, it's my honor to share the Korean experience and lessons on the evolution of PIM system. My name is Sujin Park, a professor of the Department of Ener uh, en Energy Policy and Engineering in King's. As you know, government has a role in undertaking public investment. The challenge is to ensure public investments transparent, efficient, and achieve value for money, among other reasons, to minimize the need for taxation or need for borrowing. Specifically, the goal of public investment management are aggregate fiscal discipline, allocate efficiency, and technical efficiency. Sorry. Uh, PIM in Korea over the period of national uh, rapid economic development was tightly linked with a series of five-year economic development plans. But such development plans became weakened as a guiding principle of resource allocation because of the diversity and democratization of Korean society. Uh, the Korean government began a PIM system as you see uh, from the figure, uh, which is called as Total Project Cost Management, TPCM, in uh, 1999. Although it was introduced to check the cost of individual investment projects, it was plagued due to a silo approach, which lacks the total optimization uh, because of the fragmented uh, management of the uh, public investment. Even with the TPCM, ministries uh, conducted their own feasibility studies on major investment projects. Uh, feasibility studies performed under the supervision of each ministry and they are lacked objectivity and reliability. And there were no uniform 
um, and standard guidelines. As a result, serious underestimation of costs and overestimation of benefits resulted. Only one among 33 projects were evaluated as infeasible between 1994 and 1998. Recognizing this problem, uh, the government organized interministerial task force to enhance the validity and reliability of system. As a result, a compromise reached between the central budget office and line ministries, which is called the Preliminary Feasibility Study, PFS, together with Reassessment Study of Feasibility, RSF. The introduction of the PFS strengthened P, uh, TPCM uh, through the centralization of the decision-making process. However, even with the ex ante screening process of the investment decisions, significant loopholes remained. Actual construction costs began to increase rapidly after projects passed the uh, PFS. Uh, in other cases, uh, demand forecast was exaggerated in initial stage and serious overinvestment resulted. To cope with these problems, the reassessment study of feasibility, RSF, and reassessment of demand forecast, RDF, were introduced in 1999 and in 2006, respectively. After enacting the independent and centralized PFS, together with RSF and RDF, uh, we observed the TPCM of Korea begin to function as a highly effective tool for achieving most goals of uh, PM, uh, PIM system. Uh, the figure shows the current TPCM, I mean PIM system of Korea. Uh, in case a project takes two years or longer for completion or cost more than uh, 50 billion Korean won, the head of each government uh, agency should consult with the Ministry of Strategy and Finance in advance through uh, PFS. If a, a project passes the PFS stage, uh, live ministries uh, perform a feasibility study and proceed to the stages of basic and working designs, ordering and contracting and construction, etc. Uh, whereas the uh, PFS perform a gatekeeping function in ex ante basis. Uh, the RSF and RDF focuses on um, ex post cost of burn and demand forecast bias management. Uh, where I, I touch a track record of Korean uh, uh, Korea on pass ratio and budget savings for your reference. Uh, let me just skip this page considering time constraint. Okay, now we arrive conclusion. According to Rajaranedar, a well-functioning process of PIM includes guideline, appraiser, independent review, selection, uh, implementation, adjustment, operation, and post-evaluation process. The study suggested the most effective uh, PIM systems among case studies of countries are those of Ireland, Korea, UK, United States, and Chile. Uh, especially uh, as we learned from the Korean experience, a national guide, guidance, standard appraisal process, uh, independent review mechanism, and post-evaluation process are integral part of the successful PIN although there is a considerable variation in the institutional arrangements, uh, modalities, and historical 
uh, histories across these countries, uh, they exhibit all of the eight must have features and go considerably beyond that basic standard in nearly all aspects. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay, so um, I think this is the, Korea is indeed a great example of, of uh, strong public investment management, and this was very interesting. So with this, um, we have reached the closing of our event. Um, so I'd like to thank again all our panelists and the participants who have made this session on the case for fiscal openness very engaging. Uh, we're very grateful also uh, for uh, the session organizers from OGP, the Korean Development Institute, School of Public Policy, IBP and GIFT for successfully putting together this meaningful event. And I'd like to thank uh, Polina Ornelas and Marianne Fabian from uh, GIFT and from OGP for excellent uh, organization and uh, for helping me personally prepare for this. So thank you very much. And uh, until next time, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.